Shalom and uh, welcome to today's Middle East Report. In this program today, we'll be discussing the impact that Israel has had on the United States of America, knowing that we're only days away from one of the most crucial presidential elections in America's history. Warm welcome to the program, and uh, today's guest is a good friend of mine, Stephen Briggs of Hatik for Film. So, Stephen, it's a pleasure to have you back on the Middle East Report. Um, do you want to share the, the story of uh, how we both met in Jerusalem uh, 16 years ago, back in uh, September 2004? Yeah, well, 2004, the first time we met was in the studio, actually, with uh, Howard and, um, and uh, a cameraman called Tom and uh, Lance Lambert, who I was working with at the time. But uh, I don't actually remember meeting Simon there. We met in the valley a few days later in Gehenna, which is where uh, the name hell comes from. It was where they used to um, throw all their rubbish. And I was sitting down there praying, and uh, Simon walked past, and we had a time of prayer together. And I remember very, very clearly at that time, the Lord saying, at some point, you're going to be working with that guy. I didn't think much of it, but there was, uh, you know, here we are, 16 years later, and we've been friends uh, ever since. We, we bumped into one another, I think, at CRE in 2008 or thereabouts, and that was uh, the, the rekindling of the friendship, and off we went from there. Absolutely. So it's great to have you back on the program. Um, can you explain to us uh, this new film um, that you're involved in um, called The America and Israel Effect, particularly knowing that we're only days away from what is the most crucial presidential election in US history. It'd be my privilege, yeah. We uh, have been working on a series of films ever since I returned back from Israel in 2008 called Blessing, Curse or Coincidence at Hatikva Films. And uh, there's a whole number of the films in the series that look at Genesis 12.3 being outworked throughout history. Has it happened? If so, where, when, why, how? And um, this film that we've just finished, literally in the past couple of weeks, looks at America's role in the survival of Israel and the relationship that stems, uh, goes back a few hundred years, but uh, more recent uh, times it's become centre of world attention. Uh, America and the Israel Effect documents that and looks at various presidents throughout America's recent history, um, and I say recent, the last hundred years or so, 120 years, um, and is uh, very, very pertinent to the, the time that we're currently in with the election just days away. Uh, absolutely. So do you want to introduce the trailer for Yeah, it would be my privilege to show you. You're the first TV station in the world to show America and the Israel Effect, the president's trailer. 4,000 years ago, a covenant was made that would have an enduring impact throughout history. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Without Reverend Blackstone's influence, it is quite possible that Israel would never have existed. The Jewish state that Theodor Herzl wrote years later somehow came up with remarkably similar conclusions to solve the Jewish problem around the world. Perhaps it's a coincidence. Not for 24 centuries. Since the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, has there been offered to any mortal such a privileged opportunity to further the purposes of God concerning his ancient people. In 1917, he represented that petition to then U.S. President Woodrow Wilson. You'll get a lot of angry opinions also about President Roosevelt, whether or not he was in favor of the Jews or against the Jews. To the best of our knowledge, they knew about the Holocaust. He just didn't want to do anything. Mr. Truman, one of the first documents on his desk is, what do we do about the question of Palestine? I have to do what is right. United States. I have to do not only what is moral, I have to do what is just, I have to do what is proper, and I have to do what is biblical. He knew the story and the role of Cyrus. Israel is important to the security of this country. We will defend her. And that's exactly what Nixon did. Israel was saved because of an anti-Semite. 
I feel deeply concerned at this hour. Our lessons are that those that bless them, he will bless, and those that don't come under a curse. Every country that turns on the Jews to try and destroy us, try and thwart God's will of the role that the Jewish people have in the destiny of future, somehow it always turns on them. The Babylonians, the Romans, the Spanish during the Inquisition, whoever you wish. At some point, do you stop and say, are these all coincidences? America and the Israel Effect. Blessing, curse, or coincidence. You decide. And I think most of you have uh, made up your mind on that one. Stephen, I have to ask you, what was the intention of uh, making this uh, new film and the series of the Blessing, Curse and Coincidence, series of films that Hatik first done? Well, the vision behind it came from a book um, called uh, Israel, Blessing or Curse um, that was written all decades ago now and came to the hands of a, a film producer called Hugh Kitson who proceeded to write a, a film series on that subject and he started it off being called Curse or Coincidence. Uh, I joined uh, the team in 2008 and said, well, he can't, you know, God's desire isn't to curse, it's to bless. You know, he wants to bless you and I, he wants to bless those, but he, he is faced with this... Uh, this dilemma. <laughs> and so in, in Galatians 3, we have it, it says, For Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the families of the earth be blessed, which is a direct quote from Genesis 12, 3. And um, so we see that actually Genesis 12, 3 is a, a proclamation of the gospel and the means by which it will be our work. So this series looks at that covenant promise that God made to Abraham and has it happened? Because if it has happened, it has shaped history and shaped the rise and fall of nations, empires, and we, the previous film looks at the condition of this nation and is where we are currently because of our previous decisions in light of Genesis 12.3. Um, because if we look at the United States, it's uh, very much like uh, Great Britain, um, has an incredible spiritual heritage, um, probably more so that the United States was actually founded upon um, biblical values. And what was also so significant is this year is also the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower voyage that set sail from Plymouth uh, to, the, to the New World. Um, and on board were Puritans who were escaping uh, religious persecution in Britain and wanted that religious freedom in the States and set up the most successful colon colony at uh, Plymouth Rock. Um, what compelled the pilgrims or the separatists, as they were known, um, to leave their homes in Britain uh, and to go into the unknown to make a life for themselves in the new world? Well, they, they had a conviction that God comes first before government. Is that perhaps apt to, uh, to where we are today in light of the circumstances that are going on globally? They had a desire to serve and worship God freely. We um, uh, have some good friends at Septed Isle Productions who uh, uh, have put together a pilot for a film on the Mayflower because it was a huge, momentous turning point in really the birthing of a nation as, that has become one of the greatest superpowers the world has ever known. And that, that trailer is available on the Mayflower and we'll talk a bit more about it afterwards. And it's uh, incredible to think that uh, this year is the 400th anniversary 
of the voyage of the May flower to the New World. Um, Stephen, um, we see that the, the, the only colony that actually uh, worked was that set up by Governor William Bradford um, at the Plymouth settlement because uh, a decade prior, um, Brits tried to set up the settlement in Jamestown, but that ended up being a complete failure. Yeah. But the one in uh, Plymouth Rock actually um, was very successful and then led so many more other Puritans and separatists then to, to move to the new land. And this is how we see that uh, the city of Boston was actually built and other settlements across Virginia were also set up. Um, so when these Puritans came, came over, what influence did they have on the founding of the United States to found America? on biblical values, particularly as we saw that uh, after uh, the Americans broke away uh, from Britain uh, with the American War of Independence in 1776. Well, I think ver very simply, they held the Bible in high esteem and that was the center of their society, that was the center of their structure, that was the, the, they based their, all of their decision-making process went through that filter and the resulting consequence was they, they saw as it, the title was the new world, they wanted to bring to life a reality of, uh, of God's kingdom on earth. That was the original intent, that's the, the desire of the Puritans and of course there were those sojourners that traveled with them that, that didn't know the Lord at all and weren't even remotely interested, they just wanted to push the reset button and start their lives again and so you see this mix that comes into America that um, blossoms to the, to the nation that is 300 million strong today. And uh, what's incredible, if we, we look at the founding fathers of the United States, particularly uh, George Washington and Jefferson, um, the, the way that they stole the American government was based on the fact that if you give man too much power, he will abuse it. Uh, and this is why you have the separation of power in the United States with the executive branch, for example, the White House, the Senate and the Congress to balance each other so that a president doesn't have too much power because they recognize that essentially in man's heart is he given too much power, he's going to commit evil. Um, so how much were um, the, the Bible have a huge impact on the founding ideology of the United States um, set out by the founding fathers of America and why is this so important? Well, I think the legacy that you have today is, is interesting, isn't it? The, the, the Senate and the state and the White House, of course, are still there as, as living testament to this setup because they do. They recognize, okay, yep, in the, in the heart of man, the Bible says the heart of man, there's nothing good dwells, you know, and there's a, there's a movement in our, our present society that says, oh, man can do no wrong. And so the, 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 the process of, of taking hold of the Word of God and applying it and bringing it into every area, how we relate to our fellow man, how we relate to the judiciary, how we relate to our economy, and all of these things were taken and applied in a, in a living way, and that nation has stood the testament of time as a result. Absolutely. Uh, I now go on to one of the um, great Christian reformers and theologian of the United States, uh, Reverend William uh, Blackstone. Um, why was he so critical in educating so many Christian uh, uh, Americans about the importance of the Jewish people in terms of God's plans and purposes? Well, William E. Blackstone founded the Chicago Hebrew Mission, and he was a, he was a hugely influential individual at the turn of, uh, um, well, the end of the 18th, 19th century into the 20th century. It was an amazing um, understanding that he had of the scriptures. Uh, he was a very humble man. I mean, he wrote a book called Jesus is Coming, uh, but he didn't even put his name to the book. He just put his initials, W-E-B. And he had a tremendous heart for the uh, restoration of uh, Jesus coming back to earth. That was what drove him in every decision that he made. And as a result, he put forward a petition. You'll see a clip of that in, in a minute. But it, uh, he desired to see God's word come into effect in his generation. And as a result of that, he raised a petition that ended up being in front of presidents of the US and actually had an influence in how some of the most famous documents in, in Jewish recent history um, have, uh, have been applied. So let's have a look at uh, Reverend William uh, Black. Uh, sorry, Reverend William Blackstone, um, in this trailer that comes from America and the Israel Effect. The focus began to emerge, in understanding of restorationism. That the purpose, this miraculous experience, of the uh, the story of the Jewish people, the story of Christians, and the story of America, was was related. It was really not separate things, but tied together. From 1883 to 1897, 
premillennialists, evangelicals that believed in the Lord's return, the restoration of the Jews, were coming together to read the word, to study the word, and to seek the Lord's guidance. How are they to get the message out to the wider church? To sound the midnight cry, behold, the bridegroom cometh. And these conferences became known as the Niagara Conferences. And it was the theology, the eschatology, Darby's belief in the restoration of Israel and the return of the Lord that fired that entire movement, which gave rise to men like D.L. Moody, William E. Blackstone, Cyrus Schofield, and so on and so forth. And it became the focus of restorationism, or that if the return of the Jews to their ancient homeland may have significant meaning and became important. And that's, uh, that would, of course, lead me right up to Reverend Blackstone. One of the men who was most profoundly influenced by Darby's theology was a Chicago businessman by the name of William E. Blackstone. Reverend Blackstone is one of the, one of the most extraordinary men in the entire story of restoration. Without Reverend Blackstone's influence, it is quite possible that Israel would never have existed. Uh, he referred to Israel as God's sundial. You know, if you want to know where we are in the chronology of world events, keep your eyes upon Israel. In 1878, William Blackstone wrote a book entitled Jesus is Coming, which expressed the belief that Darby had been pro proclaiming across the United States for several years that the return of the Lord was imminent and within the context of Christ's return, the Jews were soon to be restored to the land. Jesus is coming was his seminal work, and no one looked for and longed for the return of the Messiah more than William Blackstone did. Remarkable book. What was it? It says, read the Bible is all he was really saying. Open the pages of the Bible. This is what it says. This is what the future is. Just read it. In fact, there are folks who read Jesus is Coming, his prophetic work, who didn't know that Blackstone was the author because he didn't even put his name on the book. He just used his initials, W-E-B. And that book was used in seminaries and has helped uh, influential Christian leaders, especially here in the United States, to have a view of uh, the imminency of the Lord's return. But he recognized something important. If the Jews do not return, Jesus is not coming. And it's uh, amazing to think the incredible impact that the likes of Reverend William Blackstone had on the United States. And that's my next question really for, for you, um, uh, Stephen, is, is that his book, for example, he sold millions of copies around the world. It was translated into 48 different languages, yeah. which is incredible considering it's probably written about the 1860s or the 1870s. Um, but what impact did he have in terms of educating Christians about God's plans and purposes for Israel and the Jewish people, giving an eschatological perspective on the importance of Israel and the Jewish people? Well, I think there's one very, very prominent thing that will be familiar to a lot of, uh, a lot of viewers, and that was the name D.L. Moody. And he was, of course, involved in praying with D.L. Moody in the founding of the Moody Bible Institute, which is probably the most famous Bible institute, um, seminary, school, depending on what terminology you want to use, in the whole of the US. And it's still operating today. And what's interesting with uh, that Bible Institute in particular is there is a very, very strong understanding of the Jewish foundation of the scriptures and the outworking of that. And so uh, it's permeated every area of their work. I mean, Moody, Moody Radio is one of the biggest uh, radio stations, platforms across America. No matter where you are in the country, you can tune into Moody Radio. Um, and so uh, his foundation, his involvement, his desire to see the Lord's work outworked, not just in his area, but across uh, a whole spectrum was, was quite remarkable. And of course, this petition that was mentioned in that clip um, is fascinating because it was signed by 413 um, people, including uh, JP Morgan, Rockefeller. I mean, the list is, is quite astonishing of those who signed it. And the intent with that was saying, is it not the opportune moment 
for us to be involved in doing what the Bible says in restoring the Jewish people back to their homeland. And that uh, petition became known as the Blackstone Memorial. It was on the front page of the Chicago Tribune on papers across the country, and it eventually ended up getting in the front of a president of the United States. Uh, and that was motivated because of his love and his concern for um, the Russian Jews living in Russia under the programs. Uh, many were being murdered by, by the Russian czars and everything else. So um, he was also a man that was inspired by compassion as well, not only a great theologian, but, but also a great man of action and realising that something's got to be done in the wake of the rise of Jew hatred in Russia and with the programmes as well. Yeah, absolutely. He wasn't just theoretical, he was practical. Prayer is great, prayer is necessary, but prayer and action is even better. And that, that's really what he set about to do. And uh, his influence, I mean, the, the, the work that he did and what he stated, uh, has echoes, and we, we talk about this in the film, of uh, Theodore Herzl's uh, amazing work, The Judenstadt. Um, uh, this petition disappeared, and then a few years later we had it in Europe. And it, there were some very, very similar connotations. Maybe, maybe not, they can't be confirmed, but could he have been influenced, perhaps? Could Herzl have even been influenced by an evangelical Christian by the name of William E. Blackstone? That's one, uh, that's one for the history books, I think, and the one for the historians to discover, uh, which I think is also important. But um, in terms of his, uh, his legacy, to actually have such a huge petition in which is called the Blackstone Memorial, also described as America's Balfour Declaration. Uh, this probably was the first time in American history where we saw a leading theologian actually push through a very, very important political issue and put the restoration of the Jewish people on the political map to the extent uh, that the US President uh, Benjamin Harris had to take note of this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and it, w it was then put to one side and then brought, it, brought out again. It's quite amazing how it did affect every area of society. You had um, six uh, uh, city, city mayors sign this document, and I, I don't want to spoil it for you, but I, wa I want people to go and watch the film and engage and learn more about Blackstone because he was a remarkable man. And uh, if they want to see more information, they can go to um, Blessing Curse Coincidence or Blessing Curse or Coincidence.com as well as Hatik for Films. But yeah, he did an unparalleled thing that actually turn the course of America's foreign policy really up to this present day and, and where we see what, what we're seeing at this present moment. And also we see through, through your documentary um, the impact of two presidents. Uh, one uh, described as the unexpected president and that was uh, Harry Truman um, who took the presidency in 1945 after the death of, unex for the ex unexpected death of uh, Roosevelt yeah. um, in which after the Second World War, one of the most pressing issues he found on his desk was to deal with the issue of Palestine after the British um, had left the area, had handed it over to the United Nations, and it was a complete mess. And against all odds, against the advice of the State Department, against the advice of uh, America's US intelligence agencies, um, they advised him not to recognize the Jewish state, newly formed Jewish state of Israel. Um, but he did. What were the reasons, do you think, that he decided to go against all conventional advice, including those in his own cabinet, um, to actually push through that recognition of the modern state of Israel? Well, we have to remember he's a politician. And he saw that Israel, and this tiny piece of real estate in the Middle East real estate, this tiny piece of land, Americans appreciate the word real estate, was crucial to the security long term of America. And, and they have to do things and, and make decisions in light of that. So against his, at the behest of his colleagues, and there were, if you think back to our history, there were times when Churchill made decisions that his cabinet weren't so keen on him doing. And, and that, that is what makes a leader a leader. They're willing to take responsibility for decisions that actually will have huge ramifications, often against all odds. The majority doesn't just, doesn't equal sanity. I'll say it again, majority numbers does not equal sanity necessarily because the Bible tells us with one, a thousand can be put to flight. God plus one is a majority. But understanding that and understanding that this decision that he made and the fallout of it, imagine for a moment if America hadn't got that piece of, uh, that relationship in what is, the Middle East is today. How different the landscape would be across the whole world. The Bible contains the story of the exile of the Jewish people into Babylon. 
and how the Persian King Cyrus ended that exile and allowed them to return to their homeland to rebuild their temple and to establish a national life. President Harry Truman, a Southern Baptist, knew those stories and understood biblical prophecy. He was faced with the same decision as King Cyrus to assist the Jews to return to their homeland. What would the president do? He was a Bible reader on his own, independently. How religious a man was Truman? That can be open for, for a lot of debate. He was also a politician. We have to remember that part. We're not going to get around it. He knew the story and the role of Cyrus. And when the problems were coming up for 1947, what do we do for the establishment of a partition between an Arab state and a Jewish state? What were the promises of the Balfour Declaration? He considered that. What were the promises that the British had made? The decision finally came down to was his, and his alone. Remember, he was bitterly threatened by everybody. And he said, I have to do what is right. I have to do not only what is moral, I have to do what is just, I have to do what is proper, and I have to do what is biblical because he knew of Cyrus. Soviet Union. Five and a half months after this historic United Nations vote in November 1947, United States, yes. The State of Israel was declared on the 14th of May, 1948. On the 14th of May, 1948, Ben-Gurion proclaimed the creation of the State of Israel. And immediately after that, America was the first country I think within 10 or 15 minutes' time that uh, the, she, recognized, uh, she recognized the state of Israel. I think it was thanks to Truman that we managed to overcome this period and the recognition was, was given to the state of Israel. there would be another American president who would make a dramatic intervention on Israel's behalf. He was the only president of the United States to have resigned from office, Richard Nixon. Six years since the Six Day War, Egypt and Syria try again to destroy Israel. They attacked on the most holy day of the Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur. The war caught Israel by surprise, and she was in grave danger of defeat. We could not continue because just we didn't have any armament. We, we lost many people, we lost many vehicles, we lost uh, tanks and airplanes. But nevertheless, what we needed was just the ammunition in order to continue the war. As Moshe Dayan told uh, Golda Meir, who was prime minister at the time, the third temple might fall. The third temple was the state of Israel. It could fall. Panicked calls went into the American government for help. Panicked. Henry Kissinger held them back. Kissinger's reported response was, let them bleed a little. Golda Meir, rang the White House at three o'clock in the morning and spoke directly to President Nixon and told him that Israel was in very real danger of losing the war, particularly as the Russians were rearming the Syrians and Egyptians. Richard Nixon's mother was a Quaker, a Bible-believing Christian. And it's reported that when the Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir called him and pled with him for help, that he recalled the words of his mother when as a child she had said to him, one day you will be able to help the Jews. After the phone call ended, Nixon summoned his cabinet. President Nixon was livid. The bottom line, he told Kissinger, he told the Secretary of Defense Schlesinger, he says, do whatever you have to do. Send them whatever they need. 
get the, get the stuff in the air and get them the tanks, the planes, the weaponry. Get it over there now. After several more weeks of fighting, the Israelis were poised for a decisive victory over both the Syrians and the Egyptians. It was the weaponry that Nixon sent that made all the difference. It may be against world opinion, but uh, it's one thing to stand under God in his blessing, irrespective, than to come under his curse and have the favor of people around you. A third president of the United States, Donald Trump, would face his Cyrus moment. Would he defy his advisors and cabinet members as had Truman and Nixon in order to fulfill his campaign promise to declare Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and move the U.S. Embassy there? This is a historic day. On Wednesday, December the 6th, 2017, Despite much opposition from around the globe, President Trump declared the United States Embassy would move to Jerusalem. Jerusalem has been the capital of the Jewish people for 3,000 years. In 1995, Congress adopted the Jerusalem Embassy Act, urging the federal government to relocate the American Embassy to Jerusalem and to recognize that that city, and so importantly, is Israel's capital. President Trump, thank you for today's historic decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. The Jewish people and the Jewish state will be forever grateful. As our nation continues in its role as a Cyrus nation, May we see the fulfillment of God's promise in Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you. And uh, that's a great reminder to us all of the uh, incredible role that uh, God has allowed the United States of America to play in defending Israel and the Jewish people ever since Israel was re-established as a modern nation back on the 14th of May, 1948. Um, Stephen, I want to talk a little bit about that era to do with uh, Richard Nixon as president, because um, this was a very, this was a war for Israel's survival um, and very similar to Israel's war of independence in 48. And the fact is that the Egyptians and the Syrians invaded Israel on what was considered the most holiest day on the Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur in 1973. It was a surprise attack, but also that uh, Israel's Prime Minister then, Golda Meir, wanted to absorb attack as well, to say that, look, we're not the aggressors in this. Yeah. The Syrians and the Egyptians are the aggressors, but they were also backed up and supported by the Soviet Union in the Cold War. And, uh, and Nixon, um, despite him being a very um, controversial character, to say the least, with Watergate and everything else, um, went against the influence of Henry Kissinger, um, who was probably even more powerful than President Nixon was during that administration. And listening to that heart cry coming from Golda Meir to send uh, uh, weapons and tanks so that Israel could rearm and protect her civilians from what could have been an absolutely devastating war. Uh, it was, but it could have been far worse. Um, how do you think history, um, looking back, uh, reflects upon Nixon? In this area, history looks favourably upon him. I mean, he's not a, yeah, as you've said, he's an incredibly controversial president, probably the most controversial president in the past uh, uh, period. I mean, we, some would say, oh, this one that we currently got is the most controversial, but uh, um, for what he did and what he carried out and went at the behest of his, um, his colleagues in order to ensure Israel's survival is quite remarkable, really, when you look at it, his history. And it, uh, the words of his mother may have played a part in this uh, equation. Uh, be careful what we say to our children, because it can affect uh, major global decisions down the road. And, and maybe, just maybe, that mum who was a Bible-believing 
Christian um, had an influence of far greater proportions than we could ever possibly comprehend. Absolutely. And it's also important to know that up until recently, really until the President Obama era, that Israel was, um, was a non-partisan issue. So in other words, the Democrats would have strong support for Israel as well as the Republicans. But now we've seen that the, Repub the Democrats have moved so far to the political left um, that they no longer want to identify uh, with Israel. So it's really left to the domain of the, uh, of the Republicans to advocate and support Israel. Why is it that, for example, that um, if we look back also at American history, fits in with American history, because this was the first nation where the Jewish people were actually assimilated. And it was uh, President uh, Washington that allowed two members of, it, of uh, his cabinet to be, uh, I think it was uh, the Secretary of State for Education was Jewish. And he opened up America and the newly formed American state to the Jewish people. And of course, they've been blessed ever since from that. So historically, spiritually, politically, economically, uh, America's ties with Israel and the Jewish people are deeply rooted in, in the DNA of the United States of America, aren't they? Yeah, they, they, very simply their foundation was we have to give liberty and life and freedom to everybody who is part of the American dream, the American ideal, in order to enable uh, a fair footing for, for everybody to aspire and accomplish what it is they desire. And that's been carried out, that has been the historical legacy of, uh, of America, having that freedom, having that ability to make of your life what you want to make of it in reality. Um, and how that is being affected today, obviously, is a very, very, we see a very different landscape to even those early fathers and what they sought to do. And what's in interesting, really, and, and this is very much testifies to what your documentary says, that it really does make a huge difference, Genesis 12, uh, 1 to 3, that I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. Because I remember going to um, the United States during the era of uh, President Obama, mm. I think it was in 2014, and then in Canada, just north of the border, when we had Stephen Harper was Prime Minister, who was incredibly pro-Israel, the blessings and the contrast between the two nations. Because I always felt before you go to the United States and uh, there is a sense of, of a strong, deep sense of God's presence there, his protection there. Um, but under the Obama years, that felt like it all went, uh, as Obama adopted some very, very hostile uh, positions against Israel and powered uh, Israel's enemies um, and made it very, very difficult for the current Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. And then we see that God raised up Stephen Harper, the Canadian Prime Minister, to be a strong voice for Israel. So how much does this have a huge pact, impact on the peace and harmony of a nation, whether they bless Israel or the Jewish people, according to Scripture? Well, in Joel 3, it says, In the latter days, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I'll bring the nations into Emek Yehoshaphat, which in Hebrew is the, the valley where God judges. Not because of sin, it says, because they divided my land and scattered my people. Now, hang on a minute. This is nations that we're talking about. It's God who's bringing them into this valley of judgment, this valley of decision. And what's the prerequisite, preconditions? It's if they divide his land and scatter his people. So there is an application within Scripture that God has carried out to the letter. You look at the Babylonian Empire, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the British Empire. Those that have tampered with what God's plan and purpose has been with regard to the Jewish people, historically, it's never fared well for them. Why? Because it's the love of God being expressed to mankind through a nation amongst nations in the same way that the love of God can be expressed through Simon to those he knows around him. This is you in micro is what Israel is in macro. And that's why Genesis 12, 3 is so foundational and fundamental in our understanding of the love of God being expressed, that covenant love, in spite of them and in spite of you, he's still faithful. Amen. Pleased about that. Uh, and, and Stephen, I have to talk about President Trump because, uh, you know, he, he is an enigma. Uh, he's been in power for the last four years, despite everything that the Democrats chucked at him by trying to delegitimize his presidential uh, election victory over Hillary Clinton back in 2016. Then saying that uh, he colluded with the Russians and the Russians helped him get elected. And then we see that once the Democrats won the Congress back in 2016, wanted to do everything they could to actually impeach him from power. Uh, he's still here, but his track record on Israel 
it is second to none. Uh, we saw in that uh, video there that he recognised um, Israeli sovereignty over the eternal city Jerusalem and then moved the embassy uh, to mark Israel's uh, 70th anniversary as a nation. He recognised Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. Um, he also... Uh, he also took America out of uh, the UN Human Rights Commission because of its attacks on Israel and of UNESCO, defunded the Palestinian Authority because of its hatred and its unwillingness to come to the peace negotiations with Israel. And we also saw that he got rid of the devastating Iran deal uh, that provided billions in sanctions relief for the Iranian regime, but didn't actually stop them building their nuclear weapons program nor their ballistic weapons program. Um, so. In terms of what he's done for Israel, surely there's been no other president that stood with Israel and the Jewish people like President Trump. Well, he's done quite a bit in four years, hasn't he, really, when you think about it. I mean, that is quite a record. And, and you haven't even, uh, in, in the wider sphere, he met with uh, North Korea. I mean, the things that he has accomplished in his four years compared to other recent presidents is quite unparalleled. And it's, it's fascinating. Yes, he is an enigma. Uh, yes, he divides society, but yet, for some reason, whatever that is in the providence of God, he is the leader of America. And in a couple of days' time, will he be the leader for the next four years or not? That's up to the American people to decide. But the, the, the ramifications of his decision-making process and how he's gone about it is, is absolutely fascinating. And certainly he has been one who has chosen a course that uh, has blessed the Jewish people, has recognised, I mean, the embassy move, as you mentioned, uh, are just incredible. Um, what a time to be alive to witness things like that and, and how he has led the free world in that regard. Yes, people have mixed feelings about him, but I think we'll look back on his legacy as one that was tremendously, tremendously significant. I forgot to mention he's been nominated for the Nobel Peace, Peace Prize. Prize for bringing peace between Israel and Bahrain in the United Arab Emirates, as well as uh, Serbia and Kosovo. So let's have a look here. And uh, this is Mike Pence back in 2016, talking about why Israel matters to President Trump and also Mike Pence. And you can see through these three videos how uh, Mike Pence and President Trump have fulfilled their campaign promises back in 2016 when it comes to Israel. Shalom, Israel Republicans. I'm Governor Mike Pence. It's a great honor for Donald Trump and I to stand together with you tonight in support of Israel. And I'm deeply humbled to be speaking to you at this historic time and with all of you there in that special holy place of Jerusalem, the eternal home of the Jewish people. Over the course of this campaign, many people have asked me why our ticket stands so strongly with Israel. Donald Trump and I stand with Israel because Israel's fight is our fight because Israel's cause is our cause. We stand with Israel for the same reasons good people everywhere stand with Israel. We stand with Israel because her cause is just, because her values are our values, and because her fate is our fate. Israel is not just our strongest ally in the region. As I've said for so many years, Israel is our most cherished ally in the world. Currently, Israel lives under the ominous shadow of a threatening neighbor who seeks to wipe her off the face of the earth. Yet Donald Trump and I understand that Israel is not hated by her enemies for what she does wrong, but rather for what she does right. Like the United States, Israel is hated by terrorists and the failed states that support them. She is hated by too many progressives because she is successful and her people are free. There's one more thing that Donald Trump and I understand and will never shrink from proclaiming, like the United States. Israel defends herself with an army of citizen soldiers who fight their nation's battles with decency, humanity, and restraint. As Israel shows the world how to turn scarcity into plenty, sickness into health, poverty into wealth, as Israel takes the curses, the slanders, and lies of the world and turns them into blessings, the real question is how could any good person not stand with Israel? Let the word go forth from Jerusalem, the eternal undivided capital of the Jewish people and the Jewish state, that Donald Trump and I are proud to stand with Israel. The American people are proud to stand with Israel. And should Donald Trump and I have the privilege of serving this great nation, 
If the world knows nothing else, the world will know this. America stands with Israel. Together, let us all pray that God continues to bless Israel and all her citizens, Jewish, Muslim, and Christian, with life, hope, and peace. May God bless you all. May God bless Israel. And may God continue to bless the United States of America. Thank you and shalom. It is wonderful to be here in Israel. President Rivlin, Mrs. Rivlin, Prime Minister Netanyahu, Mrs. Netanyahu, thank you very much. I am deeply grateful for your invitation and very, very honored to be with you. On my first trip overseas as President, I have come to this sacred and ancient land to reaffirm the unbreakable bond between the United States and the State of Israel. In this land so rich in history, Israel has built one of the world's great civilizations, a strong, resilient, determined, and prosperous nation. It is also a nation forged in the commitment that we will never allow the horrors and atrocities of the last century to be repeated. Now we must work together to build a future where the nations of the region are at peace and all of our children can grow and grow up strong and grow up free from terrorism and violence. During my travels in recent days, I have found new reasons for hope. I have just concluded a visit to Saudi Arabia, where yesterday I met with King Solomon and with the leaders from across the Muslim and Arab world. In that visit, we reached historic agreements to pursue greater and greater cooperation in the fight against terrorism and its evil ideology. My future travels will take me to visit Pope Francis at the Vatican and then our NATO and European allies. We have before us a rare opportunity to bring security and stability and peace to this region and to its people, defeating terrorism and creating a future of harmony, prosperity, and peace. But we can only get there working together. There is no other way. Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister, I look forward to working closely with both of you during my stay. We love Israel. We respect Israel. And I send your people the warmest greetings from your friend and ally, all of the people in the United States of America. We are with you. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you. We're here this afternoon to change the course of history. After decades of division and conflict, we mark the dawn of a new Middle East. Together, these agreements will serve as the foundation for a comprehensive peace across the entire region, something which nobody thought was possible. For generations, the people of the Middle East have been held back by old conflicts, hostilities. These agreements prove that the nations of the region are breaking free from the failed approaches of the past. Today's signing sets history on a new course. Today, the world sees that they're choosing cooperation over conflict, friendship over enmity, prosperity over poverty, and hope over despair. They are choosing a future in which Arabs and Israelis, Muslims, Jews, and Christians can live together, pray together, and dream together, side by side in harmony, community, and peace. Once again, let me congratulate the people of Israel, the people of the United Arab Emirates, and the people of the Kingdom of Bahrain. God bless you all. This is an incredible day for the world.
And whatever you think of President Trump, his track record when it comes to Israel is extraordinary. Uh, within 30 seconds, um, how can our viewers get hold of uh, this latest documentary called America and the Israel Effect? OK, so there's three places you can look at. BlessingCurseOrCoincidence.com. AO.Vision is our distribution site. And HatikforFilms.com, which is at the bottom of your screen, are the three websites where the film will be uh, available for you. And it's going to be in Arabic, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, and uh, simplified Chinese are the subtitles that are already done for this film. Thank you so much for being my, my guest on today's programme and uh, a very, very crucial time in America's history. Thank you for having me. And I want to thank you for watching today's programme. Uh, the, the American people, only days away uh, from electing or re-electing President Trump, and uh, this is one of the most important presidential elections in America's history. Uh, it's a choice between someone who supports uh, Christian and biblical values, certainly his administration does, and standing with Israel and the Jewish people and confronting the enemies of Israel and America. So it's important that we pray and intercede for this vital uh, presidential election that takes place in a few days. So I want to thank you for watching today's Middle East Report. As one we stand